Hello, my name is Amanda Moyer. I'm the supervisor of the Interpreting Services Department here at PSD. We worked with the Family Resource Center to create these videos to talk to you, parents, caregivers, and families of deaf and hard of hearing children. We hope this information will be helpful. It talks about how to advocate for your child, for communication access, how to get an interpreter, when and where to get an interpreter. And if you still have questions at the end of these videos, please feel free to contact us at interpreters at PSD.org. Thank you to everyone who worked with us to make this video possible. Hey, Melissa. Hi, Amanda. So I know that families often have questions about working with interpreters. So let's just get started by talking about where do interpreters work? Sure, I think some places that families will often see interpreters are on the news, if there's a press conference, if they go to a play or a concert, they might have interpreters there. At your child's IEP meeting, if they're deaf staff, or if your child is at an age where they're participating in their IEP meeting. And also if they had early intervention services with a deaf teacher of the deaf, they would have an interpreter with them for those as well. Do you want to talk about some of the reasons why it's important to have an interpreter? Sure. So since we're talking about having interpreters for your deaf and hard of hearing kids, we're talking about situations where there's hearing folks that don't know sign language and deaf folks that don't have full access to spoken English or primarily use sign language as their mode of communication. So having interpreters there allows both parties to be able to have a conversation and communicate. It's important too that the interpreter is a professional because there's people who know sign language, but just being fluent in the language or having some proficiency in American Sign Language doesn't mean that you can interpret. Interpreting is actually really complex. So there's a lot of things that are part of interpreting. There's language, there's culture. Professional interpreters also have an ethical code of professional conduct. And that requires them to convey information between the parties without adding their own personal opinion, without adding influence or advice. And that neutrality is really important. It's also important that they uphold ethical uh, behavior in terms of confidentiality so that everything that gets said through an interpreter is held in confidence. That confidentiality and some of those other um, components of professionalism for interpreters is actually written into the code of professional conduct so that all interpreters agree to follow that when they become certified with RID, which is the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. There's also Pennsylvania requirements. So if interpreters are professionally working in the state of Pennsylvania, they have to register with ODHH, the Office for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, so that all interpreters working in the state can follow the same professional code. That makes a lot of sense. Now, I've noticed that sometimes you'll see a hearing interpreter with a deaf interpreter. Can you tell us a little bit more about why a deaf interpreter might be somewhere with a hearing interpreter and how they work together? Yeah, so an interpreter is often thought to be someone who is themselves hearing, but there are interpreters who themselves are deaf. And if you think about a deaf person having the life experience of being visually oriented to the world, of having all of their information come through um, visual information, visual learning, visual experiences, having somebody who's in the interpreter role who has all of that experience really allows them to meet the language needs of the deaf people in the setting much more effectively than a person like me who's auditorily oriented to the world. If you think about an example of somebody who's getting ready to cross the street and paying attention to the signals of traffic and the road rules for safety, a person who has hearing and is oriented auditorily to the world might think about, do they hear any horns honking? Do they hear cars coming from one direction or another? But if you're visually oriented to the world, then you might be thinking about where you see shadows or light, if you see car lights, if you see traffic lights, and those things are also there for hearing people, but we rely a lot more on hearing than a deaf person um, who's much more oriented to visual information. They also are communication specialists. So if you think about the medical field, you have general practitioners who um, are trained medically, but they don't have the same expertise in a specific area. 
So deaf interpreters have the language processing, cognitive training and information that hearing interpreters have, but they also have the native language use, which makes them communication specialists, like a neuroscientist or somebody who has that area of expertise. It's important to have a deaf interpreter in settings where the information is really complex, um, where there's heightened emotions, where there's complex medical implications, if there's brain injury, trauma, things like that. Um, or if you have learners of ASL who just aren't fluent yet, then that's another place you might see a deaf interpreter. That could be somebody who's from another country, but it could also be someone who's just gaining access to sign language later if they didn't have it since birth. So they might not be fluent in ASL yet. Sounds like a really good resource. Yeah, it can make a real big difference in terms of communication. The flow looks really different. So what if somebody is at the doctor's office or wherever I'm going and they know a little bit of ASL or wouldn't it be easier if somebody just comes with the deaf person? Do you ever get that question? Like, well, what if they just bring their sister or brother or parent or family friend to come interpret with them? Sometimes, don't you think that's easier? Yeah, I think people often think that and the truth is, logistically, if your parents driving you to the doctor's appointment, they're already there. But what we're really focused on is the access to the appointment itself, the information that is happening when the doctor is talking to the person who's the patient. And if the patient is um, someone who's maybe a teenager, then think about the conversations a doctor's having with somebody as they go through puberty, as those changes are happening in their life. Do they want all that information to be going through a parent? Do you want your mom asking those questions, answering those questions, hearing you answer? Do you feel like you can be totally open and honest? So some of that information is important to have a neutral person being in the role of communication facilitator and interpreting for that conversation so that you don't have those reasons to be less honest. Also think about the parent. Does the parent want to, have, to hear all that information? Can they be totally neutral? Are they gonna want to answer questions to the doctor that they think they know the answer to? There's an empowerment piece too. So letting people have information, letting them have that conversation directly with their provider, it's their appointment. And that's why the Americans with Disabilities Act writes into the law that having a companion, which is the language they use, which would be a friend or neighbor or family member, isn't considered compliance with the law. You need to have a professional interpreter. Hmm. And then, how does it work if a child is seeing an interpreter at their appointment? If they're really young, I mean, what age should they start having an interpreter at their appointments? And how do they know how to talk to the doctor? How does that develop in a deaf child? Yeah, kids learn how to engage in the world the same way, whether they're deaf or hearing. That's by modeling, by example, by experience. So if you have a child who's hearing and you think about what they have access to, going to appointments with their parents. They see the parent asking questions. They see the doctor asking questions. They see how that conversation goes. And they hear that over time, they learn what kinds of things get talked about in a medical appointment, what kinds of things they can say if they wanna answer a question or ask a question themselves. If there's no interpreter in an appointment for a deaf kid, they don't have that modeling. They don't have the opportunity to learn what questions to ask, to learn how to take more ownership of those appointments and have more autonomy. It's also really important to think about how deaf kids are also learning language. And so being able to see that in the appointment, having somebody modeling that in American Sign Language for them. I was talking to an interpreter recently and we were talking about a hearing kid in an appointment and when they started answering questions themselves, and if you think about a doctor talking to a two, three, four, five-year-old, the conversation looks different than a 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old. At that point, if you're talking with such a young kid who's maybe two, three, four, five, the questions might be, does anything hurt? Do you have a boo-boo? Do you want the blue or pink Band-Aid? Things like that. And if those are the questions, a two, three, four, five-year-old should have the opportunity to respond, I want the green Band-Aid. I want whatever that answer to the question is that they actually do know for themselves. And a hearing kid who's three years old can tell you what color band-aid they want, probably. So if a three-year-old 
a two-year-old whose hearing has that opportunity, so should a deaf kid. And usually those conversations start happening for hearing kids around 18 months to two years. So you mentioned that the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, is a law that requires interpreters to be provided for the doctor's office. What else does that cover? The Americans with Disabilities Act covers any place that's providing a service to the public. So that means if a hearing person has access, if they have the right to go to the event to see that doctor, then a deaf person should have the same access. It means that the places that are excluded from the law are places with membership only. So if it's a country club and you're just walking in and you want to talk to somebody, if you're not a member of the club, it doesn't matter if you're deaf or hearing. That club is specifically for members only. But anywhere else, and if that same country club hosted an event for the local community, then they would have to provide access if a deaf neighbor or hearing neighbor was going to be attending, that they would have the same participation access. So if you are going to one of those establishments that would be required to provide an interpreter, who do you contact to request the interpreter and what information do you need to provide to them? It depends on where you're going. So we've been talking a lot about doctor's appointments. For the most part, if you're talking about a medical facility, they have some sort of system in place for compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act and other components of patient protection, patient rights, ADA compliance for disabilities. So sometimes that's patient relations, sometimes it's a uh, disability services office, sometimes it's an ADA compliance office, but knowing where that department is within the hospital or medical practice is helpful to know. Sometimes you don't need to go straight to that department though. If you're scheduling an appointment, the person you're doing that appointment scheduling with can be the same person that you talked about having an interpreter. So you've been going to this pediatrician's office, your child is now getting to that 18 month age, you wanna start providing an interpreter or having an interpreter provided for them. You can ask the person who's scheduling you, we'd like to have an interpreter for the next appointment. When you tell them that, they'll already have it in the system. But if it's the first time that you're scheduling for an interpreter and they don't have that appointment in the system yet, then make sure you give them the details like the date, the time, the location, and sometimes if it's not a doctor's office, if it's social security, the person you're talking to may not be in the same physical space where the appointment is. So it's important to include the street address, the floor, the room number, and all of that information should be given to the person who's making the request so that when they contact the interpreting agency, because they're responsible for the interpreter, not you, that they have all the information so the interpreter shows up at the right time, date, and place. You can also tell them if you have preferences related to having a deaf interpreter like we talked about before, or if there's preferences, for example, this is a sensitive appointment, we'd really like a female interpreter, or this is something that we really wanna make sure um, the interpreter can arrive a little early so we can talk to the interpreter about what's expected for this appointment. It's a complicated thing. So you can add those preferences um, to the request as well. And how far in advance do you need to make that request? Most places say to try and give two weeks. Most places will also say that you definitely can't request less than 48 hours. So that, there's a lot of leeway in there. The two weeks has the greatest chance of getting interpreter available because interpreters are booking their own time two weeks in advance and longer um, and farther out than that. But if it's two days or less, interpreters might not be available. So it's hard to guarantee access, not because they're not trying, but because interpreters might not be available based on schedule. Right. Now, what happens if I book an appointment and they tell me that they'll make sure that the computer is charged or the tablet is ready for the interpreter? What does that mean? They're probably talking about something called VRI. So if you're doing interpreting through a screen, it's video remote interpreting, VRI. Some medical practices or social security offices will have an interpreter available on a remote location that they call into at a call center or working in a private office. And so those practices are actually offering to connect you to an interpreter in real time, but not in person. It's good to know if they're offering you that or asking if that's what you want. 
because in some situations that's not ideal. In some cases, the deaf person has the right to access to an interpreter in person and that's preferred. It could be because the deaf person doesn't have mobility to be able to accommodate a screen. If you have an injury where you can't move, if you have difficulty with your vision, you might not be able to access through technology. So sometimes that's the offered option, but you can request an in-person interpreter and you have a right to ask for that accommodation. Then what happens if I ask for an interpreter in person or I ask just for an interpreter to be provided and they tell me that they don't have interpreters or that they don't provide interpreters? What do I do at that point? Well, it's good to know that that kind of resistance is something you might face so you can be prepared. You can prepare yourself by knowing what the laws are that protect you, by knowing that the ADA requires that they provide an accommodation if you're making a request, which is what asking for an interpreter is. It's a communication access accommodation under the law. If there's resistance, you can talk to OVR, the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. Sometimes they have supports for helping to pay for interpreters or support deaf people for job training and things like that. If your child's not old enough for OVR yet, then you can talk to the office about what system they have for supporting patients, for supporting deaf people. I mentioned earlier that that could be a patient relations department or an ADA compliance office. So being able to talk to them. If you know what agency that um, hospital or facility contacts for their um, to request interpreters, you can also contact the agency and see if they can do an advocacy call to talk about how to navigate the process, what the costs are, what the requirements and rights are. Depends on the laws for the individual state, but there's sometimes re requirements that are state-based. So it's good to know those too, in case you end up not living in Pennsylvania with your deaf or hard of hearing child. And then what would I do if I wanted to request an interpreter for something where it might not be covered under ADA, or if I'm not sure if the ADA would provide interpreters in that situation, like maybe Little League or a baby shower? What do you do to get access for your deaf kids to those sorts of things? Yeah, it's great if you're thinking about that, if you want to make sure that your kid has access to the dinner table for a holiday or for a family event like a baby shower. Um, if you're thinking about that kind of access and you don't want to have to pay out of pocket, and that would be not that would be a situation not covered by the ADA because it's in that category of things that are private, not open to the public. You can build relationships with interpreters and ask interpreters if they'd be willing to work with you. Many interpreters who want to support the community are willing to provide services in those settings at a discounted rate or even pro bono, which means there wouldn't be an expense to you. If you don't have contact with interpreters that are willing to do that, you can also contact your local agency and see if they have something in place. Many agencies have something like a discounted rate or a community interpreting rate that covers a portion of the cost so that the families don't have to take all of that on themselves. There's also different opportunities that are created for interpreting students, interpreting interns, if they're working with a professional interpreter. So we're trying to support the field of interpreting and sometimes it's a win-win. Your kid's little league game, you might wanna have access there, but that's not something that's necessarily protected by the ADA, but maybe a student interpreter could provide access there and get some skills that'll help them professionally and give access to your family too. A lot of great options. So let's say everything works out and gets uh, put in place and an interpreter arrives for your child's appointment. What do you say to the interpreter when they get there? Oftentimes interpreters are coming into the job knowing just some of the bare minimum information. It's a follow-up or it's in the audiology practice, but they might not know the specifics of why you're there. So if you can give the interpreter a little background information, this is my kid's name, this is my kid's name sign, these are the other family members who might come up and their name signs, the more information like that, the more easy it will be for the interpreter to recognize those signs if they come up in conversation. It could also include things like, this is a follow-up for a surgery we had last week, this was a complication, so we're gonna be talking about that. 
or we just had a new member of the family that was born. And so this is a conversation that we're having about adding them to benefits, or this is something the social worker is supporting us on for resources. So the more you can include that context, the better prepared the interpreter will be for the kind of vocabulary that might come up and for the ways that that conversation might be emotional, depending on things like that. It's also helpful to think about what you really want out of the conversation. So if you have a particular goal or a particular um, end result that you're looking for, letting the interpreter know that too, so you're all on the same page. That's great information. Any last tips or pieces of advice that you'd wanna share with parents about working with interpreters or requesting interpreters? I think there's a lot of changing um, expectations in the field of interpreting, but the thing that's consistent is that your kid needs access. Your kid deserves to have an interpreter there for any of the settings where they want to communicate with their doctor or provider or where you're communicating with someone and you want to give them the opportunity to learn how to navigate that for themselves. All of these are opportunities to build empowerment and autonomy so that at some point your kid's able to do these things independently. The interpreter's there because the providers or doctors or other professionals don't know sign language. But on occasion, you might find a provider that does. It's important to check with your kid and make sure that they understand the person who's using sign language or the interpreter who's there. You can always make decisions to change out the access if it's not working. You can give feedback to the interpreter, feedback to the place that the appointment is scheduled, or feedback to the agency that books the interpreter. And if at any time you have questions, you can always reach out to PSD. People here are really familiar with working with interpreters and they have our interpreting department. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Bye.